hundreds of extras running around. At least 20 different islands. Three large pirate ships. 900 pieces. A couple of hundred thousand gold coins. Ah! Ah! Everything that can go wrong will go wrong. It's been rather challenging. It was really fun. We get to do this. It's way, way more intense than anything I've done before. Nice. Excellent. I hope it's a real entertaining, fun ride. You don't know what this is, do you? Aztec gold. My agent called and said, how do you feel about a pirate movie? Those don't come along that often. Sprawling, epic, pirate movie. The way you get an audience to really embrace a movie is go against the grain. Get somebody you'd never expect to be in a movie. I mean, come on, it's Johnny, Orlando, Jeffrey, and Kira. I mean, uh, you can't go wrong. I think there's a John Huston quote that says, I relieve myself of the rigors of directing by casting the movie correctly. And that certainly happened here. Not sure I deserve that. Giselle. It's sort of like a childhood dream, isn't it? You know, be able to be a pirate. Damn it, Jack, I was almost liking you. I know. I thought this guy has got to be just a dirty fighter. He just had a sword on his belt, probably from the time he was about 13, and just knew how to hack off heads and skewer people. The moonlight shows us for what we really are. She's a modern girl stuck in an 18th century world, so she's great fun to play. Will's love for her, he's quite straight-laced, but it's like if you imagine him in, in one of those kind of corsets that Kira wears, it's like really tight at the beginning of the movie and he's like can hardly breathe and everything's kind of really tense. As the movie moves through and as Will kind of grows, he sort of starts to untie the lace as it were, and he kind of starts to breathe more and kind of become more of a real person. As much as my daughter might like him, his prospects aren't very good and I'd be much happier if she married Commodore Norrington. Norrington is basically the scourge of piracy in the Eastern Caribbean. Pirate? I suppose I bring light where there is dark and air freshener to where pirates have recently vacated. We could use a few more ideas. It was so much fun, and it looks like so much fun when you see it. You know, you're going to come out of there and go be bubbling with excitement. I get the feeling that people don't really make films like this much anymore. What's missing now that was there in that golden age of Hollywood? It was those great character actors under contract. And that was what we did as we were writing this uh, screenplay. We said, we're going to feature these guys, and we're going to make their characters a fun and interesting and important part of this story. Open fire! We've got so much in terms of this story and the characters, and who knows what and who doesn't know what, and um, who's going to take advantage of who. This is my first time on a Bruckheimer production, and it's, uh, it's quite impressive, I have to say. We want to make the film entertaining, uh, and the way you make it entertaining is give them curveballs all the time and fastballs. It's called Pirates of the Caribbean, so you don't want to shoot it in Long Beach, you want to shoot it in the Caribbean. We had a location person that scouted all the way from uh, the Bahamas and Puerto Rico all the way to South America to find the right look of the film. It's amazing when you scout a film like this, how quickly you realize that the world is, you know, insanely overpopulated. You just go out looking for a cul-de-sac shaped bay and to find one that doesn't have a hotel in it. They just don't exist. We picked St. Vincent because it didn't have much. You know, it had a few piers in the, in the water. We extended that one pier. We built a couple of other piers. And then we augmented a couple of existing buildings. And then we added to the town so we could make it look like our universal backlot. What do you need? It was a huge challenge. We had to call upon some of the neighboring islands to kind of help support the size movie we had. The, the airport only handles small planes, so we uh, 
chartered a 747 and flew into St. Lucia and then brought everybody over by uh, boat. We brought about 400 people and um, we, I think, bought about every hotel room on the island. And then we've hired several hundred of uh, the local St. Vincent population to work on the crew as well. It's the lunch boat. Everything that they say about water movies is true. The, you know, everything that can go wrong will go wrong, you know? Just feeding the crew when you're, because as soon as you start shooting in the morning, you're four miles out. So suddenly you've got this kind of armada behind you trying to catch up, chasing you, you know, just with sandwiches. We brought 99% of everything with us. Yeah, because we did a lot of manufacturing on this job. And the thing about that's hard when you're doing a period piece like this is the availability of quantity. It's almost impossible. So what you typically have to do are research of certain items and then manufacture them. These two guys on this platform looking that way, you guys looking out to sea. Marineland is a closed up amusement park. We built a fort there. So once we scouted the, uh, St. Vincent, we found the direction of the sun and we found a location that matched that so that when we built our fort, the, the sun path would be exactly the same. That fort is made of, of uh, cement and plaster skins. It's all, it's all a facade, it's all smoke and mirrors. The walls were all, were all framed up with, with plywood behind them and we put our skins on it. We knew that there was gonna be a lot of talent up on the deck, so we, I mean, those were all framed in, in lumber and, and heavy plywood. Then we laughed, we'd do a metal lath and a concrete base over that. So we, we basically used uh, a stamping method, just like they stamp concrete for a driveway. Strike the muzzle flash! We couldn't go to shoot an existing location because the pirates rampage, set it on fire, swing on the chandeliers. Hello, Poppy. It's all built from scratch. We built the interior location at the uh, Raleigh Studios, Manhattan Beach. And then we built the exterior facade at uh, Marine Land. And then we built a miniature model to do a CG composite in the island at the location it is on the hillside. The cave set is one of the largest sets built on a stage in Hollywood. And it's a centerpiece in the movie because that's where the cursed treasure is essentially hidden. We were trying at that point to take a little bit of the Disney feel in the cave and the ride at Disneyland. So we came up with the concept that the Aztec gold is hidden in this volcanic cave in the, in the mountains. It took about uh, five months to build it, you know, with over a hundred craftsmen working on it. It was partly sculpted out of styrofoam and partly built with wood framed and plastered. We have basically a little over four feet of water, so it's a difficult set to shoot in. It's very tight. I, I take a lot of pride in, that, in the fact that, that that tank never leaked. You know, I have, a, I have an excellent crew, and, and, um, and that's what it's all about. I really feel on this film we had the cream of the crop of, of Hollywood, because everybody just thought it would be really cool to work on. Ready, here we go. The pirates are going to be very authentic and have the fear and the loathing that you want them to have, and yet you're going to have a lot of humor with that. So that's why we have gore. When you make a movie like this, you quite often get up in the morning and go to set, and you feel like you're nine years old. Back, you know, in the movies you, that sort of influenced you when you were a child. Okay, let's try that again. Not only are the sets vast and huge and everything, but when you fly out to the Caribbean and you see a whole bay built up to be Port Royal with you know, four or five huge tall ships in the harbor and hundreds of extras running around in, in, in uniform and, you know, the undertaking was so big. When I first heard of the film, I was given a call and I thought, the Pirates of the Caribbean, are we going real? Are we going like Disneyland? So we uh, got the script and then we realized that it, it was gonna be as a real a film as possible. When I walked on the stage two and saw the cave for the first time, the initial thing was like, oh, <laughs> that's very big. But what immediately took over was how beautiful it was and how, how, how well designed. As soon as you, you start doing research, you find out all of this wonderful stuff about what really happened. You immediately say, Caribbean pirates. 
and then you start pulling up everything and you see you know photos and then you go from there and then you say well if he looks like this then he has to come from this and his boat would look like this yeah this thing will jump back at least three feet my function is to integrate historical reality with movie reality my area of expertise is primarily uh, 1500 to 1900 general uh, historical information regarding uh, dress and custom and then a specific uh, expertise in, in military uh, history as well. It goes on the thumb of the, uh, of the gun captain, so that's the prop. Uh, I spoke to props early on about all the uh, appropriate types of swords and weapons. We have two types of swords principally, the short swords that you'd refer to as cutlasses uh, and what are called small swords, the long straight bladed civilian and uh, officers type swords. We have pistols, we have uh, blunderbusses which are like short uh, firearms, uh, carbines and long muskets. Pirate's best friend. All the period pieces we, we pretty much built from scratch. Built over 72 cannons, four different sizes. All the carriages for the cannons, all the metal work for them. Last time you left me a pistol with one shot. With the power is your right. Where is Jack's pistol? Jack's pistol was very important. Gore wanted a real pistol from the 1700s. So we started doing some shopping. He wanted the silver inlaid to be the real stuff from the mid-18th century. The guns that we bought from a dealer in Connecticut, uh, they were made in London by a fellow named Perry in 1760. Okay, let's go, shooters, you ready? And then uh, we uh, did a rental with the other pistols through a company in Los Angeles. They're reproductions. It's near an end! Yeah! The biggest set and one of the bigger challenges would be the treasure cave. And just trying to get the sort of quantity that Gore was looking for. This is a huge treasure. You know, these guys have been dumping this stuff here for years. We have the main treasure chest that we built specifically. And then we have the 882 pieces of Aztec gold, which are a different gold. And there was like, I would say, in the neighborhood of a couple of hundred thousand gold coins that we put in there. We probably had, I can't even think of how many cubic feet of rock that we actually painted to look like gold nuggets, as well as probably hundreds of yards of pearls and a mass of just sort of odd objects, things that would just be looted by the pirates. It just kept building and kept building and and you know, at that point you're going, oh, is it, is it too far, is it far enough? You know, because Gore is very specific on his look. His words were, the pirates aren't art collectors. They were just after the money. So I just went and just scoured all the prop houses and made huge deals with them to say, we want this, you know, this much stuff. That's great. Yeah, nice. Excellent. The scope of this film, for me, has been kind of the most extraordinary thing about it. Every day you come into work and you think it can't get any sort of bigger, it is. Anybody who's been on this ride is going to want to go see this movie because you're going to be part of this enormous adventure. This is my first Jerry Bruckheimer film and uh, just from his reputation and the look of his movies and the size and the scope of everything you're doing, you, you want to make sure that you're not substandard. You want to bring it to the level that Jerry's used to and give it the biggest look that we can get and not limit the director and not limit the scope of the film. They started with a lot of research about the Caribbean during that period and uh, the British sailors and soldiers and, and ships of that period. The film was written for three ships, mainly. We needed two military ships and one pirate ship. You know, we wanted the Dauntless to be like, you know, a hundred gun ship, and there just isn't one. So we ended up building sections of it on a barge and using models, and similarly for the Black Pearl, which had to kind of be iconic in its own right. It was the ghost ship. It's got shredded sails. It's got all these qualities. So we had to construct that ship. We also rented a real ship and ended up sailing it all the way down here to the Caribbean. 
The Lady Washington uh, plays uh, the Interceptor, the fastest ship in the British fleet. Lady Washington is a uh, period reproduction of the first American vessel to make landfall on the Pacific Northwest coast back in 1789. We went in and repainted the entire boat, changed the inside, cut gun ports for the uh, cannons that we made for the boat. We made a ship's wheel change the stern of it. We change the color completely. The color combination matched the same Royal Navy ship that we did for the Dauntless. In LA, we did approximately 49 days of preparation to the vessel. That's when the majority of the set dressing happened, making the boat look the way the art department wanted it to look for this film. We're provided with all the blueprints from the art department, and they, they, uh, they're pretty uh, adamant about being period correct. We had three large pirate ships that we built from scratch. Two that were actually seaworthy that we built on top of um, steel barges and one that was built in the, uh, in the dome over at um, Long Beach. The Black Pearl sails usually at night and it's in the full moonlight. We have a uh, heavy fog so we did the fog test out in the open waters and we saw that that was going to be pretty difficult to shoot in the water so we decided to shoot it in the Spruce Goose Dome. And then we're building that ex exact boat again on top of the barge where it can be taken out into the open seas and, and then sailed. The Dauntless came from the, uh, it's, it's the British Royal Navy flagship. So we built that on a considerably larger barge because we had about 165 feet on deck and uh, built the front section, the stern, and the uh, bow. There are little fine bits of sculpture around the stern of the ship. The sails are all built to scale. Everything, it's all very carefully researched. They hadn't told me that I'd be steering the ship until, you know, basically, you know, camera was rolling. It was really fun because we just sort of sailing this huge ship on the open seas. I just looked over my shoulder one time and there's Johnny at the wheel with the hat and playing with the gold teeth, the whole look. And, and there's me just yanking on a rope going, I can't believe I'm doing this. <laughs> We were on set several times, and we would just kind of giggle at how, you know, we get to do this. Naturally, Pirates of the Caribbean, everybody thinks that's the ride in Disneyland. We're wanting to bring that feel to the, to the show. And it's fun to go back and do this kind of stuff, because now it's like you're creating a, a ride that someone's going to take in the film. Right, that's wig, isn't it? It's really tight. Hello. Look at these beautiful hands. <laughs> I didn't want these pirates to be, you know, hooks for hands, eye patches, and trick-or-treat belts, and, you know, striped shirts and all of that. Because, you know, basically, they were rotting human beings. There was very little time to live, and you had, you know, scurvy, and the ships leaked, and there were rats everywhere. And there's a kind of really fun, disgusting quality um, and texture to that. Arr! These pirates are cursed, and that was the little little edge that it gave for me to say this is something really special. I think the presumption we've made is that they are from a floating 50-year environment. You know, theirs is a much more kind of organic look. Penny just went for it. She rented a cement mixer, put all the clothes in there, loaded it with bricks, and just ran it. I was allowed to bring over Steve Gell, who's a master distresser and dyer, and he worked on all the principal's clothes, and it's, it's an art form. So they arrive brand spanking new perfect, and a week in his hands, and they are what you see. Hey, it's clean. It's not supposed to be clean. This was a very complicated exercise in that I knew I had to have masses of backups. So I manufactured 900 pieces, and then they sent me in the bodies. You look absolutely lovely. OK, next victim. It's a bit of a madhouse when we fit, and, you know, much swapping. Oh, I've got this jacket. It'll be better on him. Um, and they just kind of came together, but... The other thing that was really a big contribution is that I had makeup and hair in the fittings. So they got wigged up, they got made dirty, so by the time I was given them, they already looked pretty good. Off you go. I remember the first day I came in for fittings and stuff, and I saw a picture of Johnny with all his bandana and his dreadlocks, and I'm like, oh, Christ, I look like an ice cream. 
And these guys just look so cool. We've had some really big days where we've had, you know, between 30 and 40 hairdressers in, and um, two to 300 background working, mixtures of townsfolk and upper-class citizens and it's an enormous circus. It's a, just kind of like an assembly line. Whatever chair is open, you either go to makeup or you go to hair. We've had upwards of 50 makeup artists at times on the show. Now this one will go, I almost have a dot to dot. See those dots right yeah. on the curve? It's a, a certain technique that we're using to create the look on these pirates. I guess in layman's terms, it's kind of a layering of color and stippling. It's not like smudged on with a sponge. It's actually stippled on with a brush. So what it does is it really gets into the creases and the crevices, and it makes them look really grimy and really cruddy. A lot of it is like rubber mask greases and inks and all kinds of concoctions that we've come up with. And we found that pretty much dish soap takes off just about anything we put on. It's really all about the teeth, ultimately. The false teeth that are made are actually vacuformed, so they're very comfortable for the actors to wear, and it doesn't inhibit their speech. Prepare to board! And it's just colored, so we never have to worry about touching up and making rotten teeth. We have several different contact lenses made from Mackenzie. Um, one of them is soft that he'll wear all the time. The hard lens really bulges out his eyes, so he actually looks like his eye is protruding a little bit. But the idea is he has a wooden eye, and of course we have a lens technician with us all the time. Lee also wears contact lenses that are really, really yellow. He just looks so evil with these yellow eyes glazing. And the opera's one of those next. Jeffrey wears contact lenses as well. They're not quite as strong. It takes the brightness out of the eye which gives him a real kind of sickly look. And Johnny actually has lenses that he wears too, but nobody would know it because I had contact lenses made for him that were actually sunglasses. And he wears those here when he's out shooting in the sun so he's not squinting all the time. I'm gonna teach you the meaning of pain. Jacoby's kind of an interesting guy because his beard is always on fire. We uh, built a big beard for him, and within that beard, we added these dreads that have wire in them with little copper sockets at the end. And we insert these uh, incense wedges, and we fire those incense wedges up, and then he smokes the whole time. And it's, it's kind of a big ordeal because every take, we have to replace the incense and relight them. He's been burned a couple of times, and when he's doing action stuff, when his beard flips around, he might, you know, burn somebody or, it might like part start part of his beard on fire or you know singe you know you kind of always smell burning hair around this guy <laughs> ready and action it's going to have all the thrills and chills that you would expect from a big adventure the stunt work on this was was way way more intense than anything i've done before but uh, i'd say the most difficult thing was just remembering all of the moves in terms of the sword fights. So we circle. Sorry, once again. They were more kind of precise. There was more involved for these specific beats. That dog's recircle. This was definitely very demanding for everyone. One, two, three. Wow, that was wrong. I'm the sword master, and I started in 1952 with Errol Flynn on the Master of Ballantrae. That gives me 50 years of service in the film industry. You name a, a sword fighting sequence that blew your mind in any huge movie, it was Bob. In, out, in, out. The screen fighting is uh, choreographed stuff which both combatants know about, and uh, they make it as large as they can so that it is picked up by the audience. Bob Anderson understood acting with a sword. He said, just because it gets faster doesn't mean to say it's better. He said, you know that as an actor, it's the beats in between. And you're taught to hold it. Then you're taught how to use it. Attacking, you use the front edge of the blade. Yeah. When you parry, which is defense, you use the strong part of the blade, which is no. Once you know where to put your sword at the right time and place, that is the beginning of it. The routine now has to be rehearsed so it can be done with speed and agility and feeling and timing. It's like muscle memory, you know, your, mu your muscles have memory in the same way that your brain does. So when you're learning a sword routine, you kind of go over the routine numerous times in order to, for it to sort of sink in. 
It was interesting because I kind of learned the choreography to these things before I actually knew the character fully. So it was kind of interesting to uh, incorporate the character into the into the moves. <laughs> When I had my meetings with uh, Gore, he presented his concept, and uh, I got excited listening to Gore explain his vision of the project because he has the, the energy of, of a little kid. I loved Captain Blood, Crimson Pirate, um, you know, all of those movies. It's just that there's something about piracy. Welcome aboard the Black Pearl. I think what's fun about the, the first big sword fight between Orlando and and Johnny is, it's the kind of classic first set piece. I'm having a lot of fun with it, but there's no doubt that at any moment someone could lose an ear. You all right? Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> it's good to go. We go through an exhaustive uh, rehearsal process with everybody, and it's, it's pretty intimate. What I call my quiet time with the actors, where we talk things through and, and take sort of a low-key internal approach to it. It's one thing to, to learn the choreography of a, of a stunt action or a sword fight or a fight or, or whatever it is, but then, then they have to start coloring it with their characters. And I try to let the actors do that from day one. And that's how the collaborative effort starts rolling. You like pain? <laughs> try wearing a corset. When I first read the script, I was like, oh, this is going to be easy. I'll, I'll sit in the back of carriages, I'll wear pretty dresses, I'll pout a bit, you know, it'll be fine. But actually, I've had a lot of stunt work to do, um, which, for somebody as lazy as me, has been rather challenging. I've been standing on this plank for two days, absolutely petrified. I mean, completely petrified. So when the time came to jump off, Gore, the director, said to me, um, you know, you don't have to do this. We can, we can get Sonia, your stunt girl, to do it. I was like, I've been standing up here for two days. Do you really think that I'm not going to jump off this thing? I think I came up smiling, actually. It was fantastic. I was just so glad that I had hit the water and I was still alive and that a shark hadn't jumped out and eaten me. You know, it was great. You have to really be true to the genre and you have to deliver the great sword fight. The film has its big set pieces sort of spread out. There's an attack on the town, Jack's escape. There's a huge boat-to-boat -boat battle sequence. And then there's kind of a sneak attack on the, on the Dauntless at the, at the climax of the third act. When the Dauntless battle begins, all the pirates are skeleton in that. So we shoot it live, and then we do reference passes with nobody there, where the uh, opposition has to fight air. Our stunt coordinator was really great at choreographing these sequences. It's very difficult for his team and ultimately cameramen as well to set a composition, photograph it with the British Navy, let's say, and the pirates, and then remove the pirates. And so not only are you photographing air, you're also kind of thinking, okay, that's the moment where that guy hits that guy, and then I'm gonna pan over to this skeleton who's not there. It was like a choreographed dance with all these stunt guys beating themselves up, basically, with these imaginary opponents. It's like you've been learning a tango with someone for a month, and then they go, OK, now do it without your partner. And you just feel like an idiot, um, you know, kind of lunging at midair. It was so much fun, really. I mean, we're making pirate movie here. It's like, you know, it's like every boy's dream. I think it provides all of the kind of things you'd expect from a Bruckheimer picture, um, yet it tapped into something I don't know, something, you know, again, that sort of nine-year-old, you know, that's still there. We all understood that we wanted to capture the feeling of, the, of this epic pirate thing, but we all uh, agreed that, that we're going to take a fresh approach to this, something that, that'll be generational, something that'll, that'll last. That's not very nice. <laughs>《Start believing in ghost stories, Miss Turner. You're in one!' The first thing that Gore said to me when I first met him was, "'When was the last time I saw a decent pirate film?' And action! If you look at kind of cinema history, Hollywood used to make these movies a lot, and then they just got too expensive. With the kind of advances in digital 
you know, animation, you start to see all of these films coming back. So you're basically taking what, what we've been doing in cell animation and making it photo real. That's interesting. All right, looks good. The visual effects on this picture fall into three categories. There's the matte paintings that are for establishing environments. There's ships at sea. And there's the skeletal pirates. We ended up building miniatures of all three of the ships that are depicted in the, in the film. Even though the Interceptor was a complete ship, we needed to build a miniature of it because there were a couple of scenes that just really couldn't be done with the, the Lady Washington. Um, one of them is this big storm, but it represents uh, you know, much bigger swells than you really want to take the Lady Washington out into. This is certainly one of the biggest things we've done. We've got this 70 by 140 foot pool, 40 inches deep. The ship's mounted on a big rig that puppeteers it. And, uh, you know, we have real scale sails and we have big fans to fill them with air. We have dump tanks in here that hold 750 gallons of water. They're going to dump down that chute and basically hit the boat on the side, healing the boat over. We also have uh, two different wave makers in here. And this is all being done this way because it would be extremely expensive and extremely dangerous to do something like this in the open ocean. Another big thing that necessitated us building a model was that it gets blown up. Fire! A lot of effort went into designing what do the pirates look like when they're skeletons so that they all have recognizable features. There was a lot of discussion about you know, how do we get these guys to a place where they are kind of alive yet decomposing. We started off by doing a lot of these early concepts paintings of pirates in their sort of skeletal cursed form. This was a direction that we didn't end up going in. What we have on the wall is uh, sort of side-by-side -side comparison to headshots that we got of the actors who were cast to play the Barabosa's crew. We started by playing around with how much meat to bone ratio we wanted. For instance, this character right here, we actually uh, took digital photos of uh, turkey jerky and grafted sort of this turkey jerky texture on top of a skull that we had taken a digital photo of as well. And then, you know, added little flakes of skin kind of coming off the chin and, and matted hair and to sort of give each one of the pirates their own sort of unique pattern of decay. This is uh, the Jeffrey Rush skull. Um, so we started with our uh, generic skull and then modified it to fit his face. And we were able to uh, sculpt the skull behind it into form fit it inside to become the skull of the character. It, it essentially starts with the modeling supervisor and the modeling staff building the exterior skin. That'll go to the, what we call the view painters and the view painting supervisors. And they make sure that it's got the proper color, uh, that you get the right kind of little microscopic bumps and, and detail. Using this skin that um, we created over in the model shop and then scanned into the computer, I can then paint from this view and I can add to the decaying flesh look on his face. The envelopers make sure that that skin, the, that the modelers have generated follows the articulations of the bones that we've put into the skeletal system. Then we can continue to take other elements of their high resolution geometry, uh, such as the clothing, and start designing that so that if a creature spins around, the clothing will, will sort of move out a little bit or will collide properly against the body. When you marooned me on that godforsaken spit of land, you forgot one very important thing, mate. I'm Captain Jack Sparrow. We've got really good actors cast in all these roles. So the decision was made uh, that what we should do is anytime there's a skeleton, we should shoot a performance reference of them. And then so at some point during the shot, we get what we call a clean plate, which is the uh, camera operator reproducing the, the same move that he did without the actor present at all. And that lets us draw some of the background to help erase the actor when he's supposed to be a skeleton. One day I had to go and put on this weird kind of uh, track suit with little, tiny little ping pong balls and go through my action. It's like when Jeffrey stabs me, I back up into the moonlight. So I had to basically redo the scene, but by myself, wearing this bizarre uniform, you know, with ping pong balls. 
That's interesting. One of the big challenges I found on this movie is the uh, detail that, that we have to um, mimic the actors' performances. That way we have something that's already been approved by the director, it's a performance that they're happy with, and it's also a performance that's done by the actor who we're trying to emulate in the shots. <laughs> So what now, Jack Sparrow? Are we to be two immortals locked in an epic battle until Judgment Day and the trumpet sound? <laughs> Ultimately, all of those different elements all sort of come into a hub of the what we call the TDs, or technical directors, that take all that information and on each frame make sure that it has proper lighting, and they render it to make it look uh, as photo real as we can get it. I hope we take it to a new level. I hope we take the, a pirate movie and the swashbuckler part of it to a new level, and that's our intention. It feels like when the Beatles, you know, came to America. People have been sitting out here since 6.30 this morning to get in here. Where else would you want to have the premiere but other than the place where it originated? This is the first time I've come to Disneyland, and it is a slightly surreal way to see it for the first time. The outdoor theatre thing will be absolutely amazing, and I think everyone's going to have a great time tonight. Did you guys buy out all the red carpet in, in L.A.? In the world? This is a long one. Can you believe we actually get to do this? You know, this is what we're doing, like, we're living. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, the film is about to begin.